Hello and welcome to the Oneida County History Center's very first virtual lecture in our virtual lunchtime lecture series. We are very excited to have Barb Donaty here today to be giving her presentation in search of what she left behind. Uh, the program was originally scheduled to take place in person in March, but unfortunately that was not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so we are very excited and very thankful that Barb is brave enough um, to be our very first presentation. So with that, I will pass over the mic to Barb. Thank you, Rebecca. It's lovely to be here. And it's lovely to celebrate the women that I'm going to be showing shortly. And with that in mind, I would like to just take the screen off of me and begin my presentation. So that'll just take a couple of minutes and please bear with me. I have a lot to show you. This presentation found roots in the two volume series, Women Belong in History Books, 1700 to 1950, Herkimer and Oneida counties published in 2015 and 2016, edited by Jane Spellman. I was very happy in 2014 when Jane approached me and asked me to help her out on this new venture that she was starting. And that was to write about women in the area who she was afraid would be forgotten if their stories were not told. I was thrilled that she asked me to be one of 35 or more authors that would help her accomplish this task. And what happened as uh, started with one book snowballed into two books. It also snowballed into um, many talks in front of groups, uh, books being donated to all of the school's libraries, and also um, Profits from the book were used to support women's causes and presentations. So it really, and it's ongoing. Women are still being looked up, even though the two books are completed and have been published for a number of years, women are still being looked up and their lives being told in different ways. Here's the two volume series. Volume one is on the left and volume two is on the right. And here is a picture of Jane. Next to her is Lori. Lori was one of the four authors, including myself, who did the bus tours. And she also, along with myself and everyone involved in these books, know that Jane is so enthusiastic and her enthusiasm for history is contagious and being around her you just learn so much because of her intelligence and you want to learn more because of her enthusiasm. So my group included Lori Gabriel Knapp, Deb Kidder, and Donna Rubin. We conducted bus, four bus tours. During this bus tours, we took the historic women from the books as well as others that we discovered along the way and recreated their lives in the areas where they lived. The four bus tours. In 2017, we did a central Herkimer, which started at Fort Herkimer, then it went to Herkimer, the village of Herkimer, Middleville, Newport, Colebrook, Fairfield, Salisbury, Dodgeville, Little Falls, for a total of 75 miles. That's the one, the circle in white. Our second bus tour was through the, the city of Utica, and that started at Welsh Butch Road and Culver Ave, and that was for a total of 20 miles. Our third bus tour in 2018 was also uh, through Utica. This one started at Bag Square, and that was for a total of 20 miles. We did that for the Oneida History Center and their women's conference. Our fourth bus tour took place in 2019, and that was through Southern Herkimer, and that's shown in the yellow. Started at the Frank Frankfurt Fairgrounds, and that was through Ilian Herkimer, East Herkimer, India Castle, Van Hornsville, Jordanville, South Columbia, and Mohawk for a total of 75 miles. And uh, I divided the ladies that we've worked, 
that we worked in discovering into categories. And the first category being the Palatine Pioneers at Fort Herkimer Church. And if you see the picture on the right, that's Don Fenner. He's part of the Fort Herkimer Association. And he gave us a tour of the church. And he's dressed in period costume. And uh, we actually have a picture of the church there at the bottom left. That is a present day picture. And this church is on 5S in East Herkimer. It was built in 1756. Herkimer Home, which uh, is above that, was a structure that was uh, several hundred yards northeast of this building. The buildings were fortified and um, what they were safe havens when there was Indian attacks or later on when there was Tory and Indian attacks for the people to congregate, rush to and be, and be protected. So the first actual lady that I'd like to talk about is Catherine Herkimer. She was a young Palatine immigrant and she received over 100 acres of land through the Burnettsfield patent. She married Johann Jost Herkimer and together they raised 13 children. Can you imagine 13 children on the frontier? They carved out a home which became fortified fortress for area settlers to seek refuge in times of danger. I have the name of Ernestina Starring and we have the names in between and I'll explain why there's so many names. She also lived around the Fort Herkimer area. Her first husband was in the local militia and he was believed killed during a Tory and Indian attack. Her second husband, Bellinger, was also in the militia and he died while gathering hay and being attacked in a Tory and Indian ambush. He's buried in the Fort Herkimer Cemetery. She and her third husband, Adam Starring, settled in the Fort Herkimer vicinity. There's a story, kind of a local legend, that her first husband was not really killed. He was captured by the Indians and brought to Canada and was a prisoner for several years. And upon his release, he came back and he saw from afar that Ernestina, Ina, Ernestina had a family and was very happy. So he left her and just moved on. And as I said, that's a local legend, but it makes Ernestina quite an interesting person. Dealing with history's upheavals. And we went to the Indian Castle Church and we were given a tour by one of the ladies that is part of the organization that takes, of, takes charge of this church. And as you can see by the plaque on the, far, on the top right, it is part of the Mohawk Upper Castle archeological site. It was built in 1769 by Sir William Johnson. And what was exciting about this is when we loved the tour of the church, we got to uh, look in the back, there's a cemetery in the back, and we actually, Donna Rubin was able to locate Indian graves that were marked by iron crosses. And we were just so excited about that to connect history with the actual location present day. Okay, on the left side, we have Molly Brandt. And Molly is portrayed on a Canadian stamp that was issued April 14th, 1986, honoring her. Why a Canadian stamp when she was here in this area? Well, Molly was held in high esteem by the Iroquois and the British. Sir William Johnson, the superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Northern District often saw her influence in treaties and land dealings with area tribes. He and Molly had several children together also, and, and uh, he was happy to, in his will, leave her land as well as all the children. So he passed away, and uh, a year or so later, in August 1777, Molly sent word to the British forces surrounding Fort Stanwyck that the Tryon County Militia was marching to give assistance to the fort. Now, 
uh, that battle ensued, um, Molly fled to Canada. She, along with other tribesmen, fled to Canada, and they were in tough shape. And Molly fought hard for to get the British to help them out. And she continued to be the connection between the British and Native Americans. That's why Molly was held in high esteem in Canada. Barb, could you talk a little bit louder, please? Sure, I'll turn up my volume. Thank you. Okay. Now we have Nettie Bowen Smith. Okay. Okay. She traveled with her husband to join the 7th Cal U.S. Cavalry, one of the four units formed to protect settlers commanded by General George Custer. She and Libby Custer were good friends, being part of a camp followers who joined their husbands whenever possible. All that changed at the Little Bighorn on June 26, 1876, and Custer's last stand. She lived on Washington Street in Newport, and we, act, we have a picture of the entrance to the, gray, the cemetery, and she's buried in the Newport Cemetery. Mary Zoller. Mary Zoller is shown in front of the Mohawk Village Market. Why? <laughs> she had nothing to do with the Village Market. But at one time, there was a hotel there. And the, it was uh, in this Bates Hotel was the Bates Theater, where they showed silent films. Mary was, uh, at a young age, was a piano player while the, these silent films were being shown. Now, later on in life, Mary formed a musical group called Polly Jenkins and the Plowboys. This well-liked vaudeville act performed all over the country in theaters and on radio in the 1930s. During World War II, she entertained stateside troops as part of the trio, consisting of herself, Uncle Sam, and Texas Rose, presenting over 300 U.S. shows. And I have a little clip of her music and hopefully you'll be able to hear it. I'm gonna settle my saddle and ride, 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 till I left some cowboy time. I'm gonna wander out yonder so far and wide, till I find a romance to try. Helen Sperling. I have her with the Jewish Community Center. She was part of this center. When Helen was a young woman, she experienced the atrocities of con containment in a concentration camp. She and her husband moved to Utica after the war. During her many talks to audiences in the regions, she emphasized the lessons learned from the Holocaust, which promote peace and understanding. Next to her, there's Anna Marley, and I have her with Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville. And this, that ROCO stands The monastery was founded in 1930 by two Russian immigrants. The monastery maintains several cemeteries on its property, which collectively make up one of the largest Eastern Orthodox cemeteries in the United States. There is also a wonderful museum here at this site, and I encourage people to go to it when we're able to. Uh, last year, they had an exhibition about the last days of the czars that was just wonderful well presented. And now she was an inter... Uh, uh, now on to Anna Marley. I almost jumped ahead. I was going to have you listen to her, but I have to introduce her first. She was born in Russia at the start of the Russian Revolution in 1917. Her mom and she, babe in arms, fled 
um, because they were related to the czar. Her father got killed in the upheaval and they fled to France. She became an entertainer, but as uh, World War II began and uh, Germany took over France, she once again, she left. And she was an entertainer in England through the BBC. And what she would do is sing songs that inspired the resistance to keep on fighting. And in a short while, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the, the clip. After the war, people came up to her and said that her singing just inspired them so much they didn't give up. Anna and her husband immigrated to America after the war, settling in the area because of its close proximity to the Holy Trinity Monastery. Her husband is buried in one of the monastery cemeteries. Okay, we're gonna hear the song that inspired, oops, excuse me, that inspired others to keep on fighting. It's in French and I'm gonna translate. Mate, do you hear the dark flight of the crows oui, over our plains? Mate, do you hear the muffled clamor of enchained countries? Hey, partisan, workers, and peasants, this is the signal. Tonight, the enemy will know the price of blood and tears. Next, the Ladies of Fountain Elms, which is a well-known site in Utica on Genesee Street. Fountain Elms was a gift by Alfred Munson to his daughter, Helen, and her husband, James Williams. The house was completed in 1852. It had the modern convenience of having indoor plumbing and had a furnace. Helen was a prolific 19th century collector of decorative and fine arts. She was well known for her generosity to individuals and the community. Rachel, with her sister Mariah, expanded their mother's art collection. They also adapted her civic mindedness, giving large sums of money to local organizations. Both sisters married Proctors, Proctor Brothers. Um, and together with their husbands, they were power couples in Utica, making donations, building buildings, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later. But what I'd like to show you on the next screen is Grace Church, which the family, Alfred Munson, uh, who was Helen's father, he started, he put the money down for the beginning of the church. Helen continued, and we have these beautiful windows in the church that if you've never been there, I encourage each and everybody to go. These are awesome windows. And the windows in them over the main altar, they were designed by Henry Holiday and commissioned in 1890 by Helen in memory of her parents. Unfortunately, she died before they were installed. Her name was added to the memorial. And this is considered Henry Holiday's, one of his best works. And it's the worship of heaven and earth and all creation. These themes are integrated horizontally as well as vertically. On the right side, there is a, a, a window from Lady Chapel, which was constructed in 1923. Uh, the window there is, uh, follows the Parable of the Lilies by Louis Tiffany, and it was added in 1931. Lady Chapel was, uh, was donated uh, in 23, and in 26, the parish house was built, and these were all uh, done as a memorial to the Proctor women. 
Henderson estate. We have four women in the Henderson estate. Three of them are related and one isn't. And I want to tell you a little bit about the Henderson estate. King George gave James Henderson 16,000 acres for his services. He was a physician. And this compromise comp comprised much of what is Herkimer County. Henderson House was built as a summer home. It was a wooden structure of 24 rooms. Harriet Douglas, whose picture is featured there, was the great granddaughter. And she had Galstone Castle built in 1833, the replica of a castle by the same name in Scotland. It had 20 rooms, eight bathrooms and three sitting rooms. When she died, her estate went to her niece, Fanny Monroe, who was married to Douglas Robinson. Okay, so we have, now we're talking about Corinne Roosevelt Robinson, the second one from the left there. And she was a noted speaker and uh, author writing volumes of poetry. She also wrote a biography of her older brother, President Theodore Roosevelt. She was his youngest sister. And she also uh, was a community leader in the area. She and her husband had the Jordanville Library built in memorial to his mother and father. And now we have Helen Roosevelt Robinson. My sister and I did the biography of Helen and she was an interesting person. She actually was born in Hyde Park. She was Corinne's daughter-in-law. And she was born in Hyde Park. And the other famous person that came from Hyde Park it was her uncle, Franklin Roosevelt, who was actually six months younger than she was. Her father and Franklin shared the same father, but they had different mothers and her father was much older. Helen married, as I said, Corinne's son and Corinne was Teddy's sister. So actually she was related to both sides, similar to Eleanor Roosevelt. She was related to both sides of the Roosevelt family. Her husband got involved in politics and he was working his way up. He was uh, going, he had been assistant secretary to the Navy, a position that two other Roosevelt's also had, um, followed by a couple more Roosevelt's had the same position. But Uncle Teddy had the same position and at one time Franklin was assistant secretary to the Navy. And unfortunately he died uh, before he wishes to um, achieve po pol political uh, fame occurred. And, but she enjoyed the area and there's lots of stories about her. And one of the stories I wanna tell is when my sister and I were researching, I went to the archives in Hyde Park to the Roosevelt Library there and was able actually to pull out a prayer book that she held at her wedding. And this prayer book was signed by um, her husband's uncle, which Teddy Roosevelt, who was president at the time, and in her wedding party, uh, a pair that had not been married yet, but would be married within a year, were Franklin, so his signature was on the book, and Eleanor's signature was on the book. And my excitement, I, could, it, I couldn't contain that excitement to see this little book with such dignitaries, evidence of their lives there. The last person, Galena Vistaskaya. And she was a world-renowned soprano named People's Artist of the Year in 1966 in the Soviet Union. She and her husband, conductor and celloist Mistalas Rostopovich built a home on the Henderson estate in, 18, in 1983 after they had been exiled from Russia. The couple were eventually welcomed back to their native land after the fall of the Soviet Union. And here we're going to listen to some opera and hear Galena.
top left is a picture of Galstone Castle. And down below is the rest of Hobish Mansion. Unfortunately, Galstone Castle is in ruins now. The last inhabitant was Helen, and uh, she left in 1962. Um, the Rostopovich Mansion was built in, eight, in 1983. It still stands. At one time, there was an open house, and people could go in and, and walk past the ruins of Galstone Castle and then into the Rostopovich Mansion. And this was exciting to see. I was thankful I had the opportunity to do it. But one thing I took away from uh, viewing the Rostopovich Mansion was that there was a special screens put on uh, windows and the doors that if there was any kind of alert as uh, there might be retaliation for this couple in exile from the Soviet Union, these uh, windows were completely covered and bulletproof. Uh, the area uh, is now owned by a company that for a while was having concerts there. In the last couple of years, there's been uh, some litigation between the partners that own the company, and um, it's, it's up in the air, so there's no availability to see anything on, on this property. All you see is that sign at the entrance, the top right sign. Okay, so now we have notable women with well-known names. And, uh, they're in front of three. Three bus tour passengers, and they're being greeted by members of Landmark Society who gave us a tour. And I'd like to talk about Blandina, who was a writer, and she was wrote many different types of articles in a range of publications. She was a regular contributor to the Observer Dispatch. Blandina's most popular book, A Sketch of Utica, published in 1895, was a reflection of earlier times, people and places. And actually, I would like to describe this place using her own words. In 1820, Judge Morris began to lay out the groundwork to plant the trees and shrubs on the part of Bleecker property, since known as Rutger Place at the head of John Street. In the family, the place never had a name of any pretense. It was, and is today, called The Hill, or Up on the Hill. Miller's Folly was a name given by many at the time. So remote was it from all neighbors and friends. A carriage seen crossing John Street Bridge was surely coming to the hill, for there was no other place to go through. The lane, the muddy lane called John Street. Julius Seymour Conklin, she was actually Blandina's aunt, and she came to live in this place when she was an adult and having a family of her own. She was from a family of political wealth, political prominence and wealth. She was married to Roscoe Conkling who became a power broker in the Republican Party. She was the first regent for the newly formed Oneida chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Next up, we have some other prominent names. And I'd like to point out on the left, the picture on the left, the Dutch Reformed Church in Herkimer. This had an interesting history. The first church built there was burnt burned during the French and Indian War. The second church that was built in 1799 was burnt too in, 19, in 1801. The third church was started in 1804. It lasted until 1834 when fire consumed it, as well as the county jail. This fire was start, started by a prisoner at the county jail. The existing structure was built in 1835. In 1912, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Company of New York City completely redecorated the channel. This um, is a remarkable building, and if you're ever able to see the inside of it, it is something to see. Maria Spinner, 
She immigrated to America with her husband, Reverend John Peter Spinner, who became the head of the Dutch Reformed Churches in Herkimer and Fort Herkimer. They had nine children. Francis, the oldest, became Herkimer County Sheriff and Congressman. In, 1890, in 1861, President Lincoln appointed him treasurer, and he remained in this position through Presidents Johnson and Grant. He was the first to employ women to federal jobs. On the right, Sophia Bag of Bag Square and Bag Hotel. You see there the memorial sign there that's left. The hotel no longer exists. She was married to Moses Bag Jr., the second generation of family to run the Bags Hotel. She helped organize the Oneida Missionary Society as well as the Maternal Society Sewing Bees held in the parlor of the hotel. She raised money for several charitable causes. Serving God. Sophronia Cohn, interesting lady. And I tried to locate uh, some place where I could say that was significant in her life. And the place that I came up with is the street that she lived on and the view that she would have seen. This is Osborne Hill Road, uh, also at one time called Farrington Hill Road. And she would wake up to this view every morning. And I think this is what grounded her in her faith and her compassion to helping others. She was the first female single missionary to Liberia, making the trip there in 1883 on the Jupiter, a ship carrying 70 free black emigrants, as well as other missionary couples. She survived African fever and stayed alone behind when the remaining missionaries left. So here she was, a single woman left in this new continent uh, with the with these other passengers on the boat. I think it showed a lot of courage on her part. And she was able to help out, organize the church, school, and a temperance society. On the right, we have Ellen Elizabeth Lavender, Mother Lavender. She was a former slave who preached about the need to be close to God and the need to give help to the poor. Every New Year's Day, she organized a meal to feed whoever wanted to attend because she sh believed that no one should start the New Year hungry. And what I chose to locate Mother Lavender was um, a apartment that she lived in on Hotel Street. And as you can see, there's not much left to the apartment, but um, at one time, this would have been where she had her dinner. The dinner was moved because um, apartments couldn't accommodate. She was getting hundreds of people coming to the dinner. St. Mary Ann of Molokai, born Barbara Cope. She lived on Schuyler Street with her family until she became a postulant with the Sisters of the Third Order of St. Francis, eventually becoming Sister Marianna. She was instrumental in establishing St. Elizabeth's Hospital and St. Joseph's Hospital in Syracuse. She is significant to my family because my grandson was born at St. Joseph's Hospital two years ago. So thank you, Sister Marianne. In 1883, Mother Marianne and six other sisters journeyed to the islands of Hawaii to assist the victims of Hansen's disease, leprosy. For her tireless devotion to her patience and faith, she was canonized as saint of the Catholic Church on October 21st, 2012. To the right is the garden dedica dedicated to Sister Mary Ann, which was opened in 2017. Oh, these ladies are all related to libraries in their area. Helen E. Russell. Now, I am the one that researched Helen and I could not find a picture of her. And, but this, Helen actually brought me um, some knowledge that I didn't have before. 
In researching her, I was able to locate her obituary. She died in 1935. And while scanning the paper page of her obituary, I just looked to see what the ads were like or what else was on the page, I came across another name. And this name was Elizabeth Dunnity, which turned out to be my husband's great grandmother. And it told her obituary told about her life, which was something that I had not known. So by looking at Harriet, I was able to find out more about my own family. And we had, Harriet was instrumental in starting the library. And she, for 37 years, she remained as the president of the Board of Trustees. Ella Etzel, she moved to the area because of her husband's medical practice. She worked get hard gathering support and donations for a library, which received its charter in 1915. Her picture is on the wall of the library, and she's known as mother of the Middleville Library. Alice Dodge, she spent 42 years with the Utica Public Library. For 23 of those years, she was served as director. She held leadership roles for various clubs and com community organizations. She was the first female head of the United County Historical Society. On to the artsy type, Ellen Clapsaddle. She had a home in Columbia. She was born in that area. It's no longer there. But what is still around are postcards designed by her. Her postcards depicted smiling children dressed in period clothes engaged in childhood pursuits. These postcards were much sought after for a while, but their popularity faded for various reasons around 1917. Gertrude Kern. She was a highly talented musician and member of the B Sharp Club founded in 1904 to encourage a broader cultural exposure to music and dramatic art among its members and the community at large. Through her efforts worldwide, renowned artists were brought to perform locally. Her legacy continues, as you notice in that uh, clipping from OD.com. And it is about, um, it's an article from 2018 where it announces the current music scholarship, which still continues. So that was the 91st year. This would be the 93rd year of that scholarship. Grace Paul. She was an artist who for a time was head designer at Norcross Cards. She illustrated many children's books and wrote and illustrated several her own. The picture on the top right is from one of her books, Pancakes for Breakfast. She bought the 1857 historic feed mill in Colebrook in 1954 and opened it as an art studio and antique shop. Its picture is on the left. Her sketch of it is on the right. Poland Library contains several of her paintings and books. Pearl Nathan, she began the Broadway Theater League in 1957. She rallied public support to save the Stanley Theater when it was threatened with closure in 1974. She would stand at the top of the stairs, the large staircase in the Stanley at the end of the shows that took place and would wish everyone farewell. And her portrait is on the second floor of the Stanley. Women involved in science. Mary Breed Holly Myers was an interesting lady and I'd like to read the caption that's under the picture. Mary, Breed, Mary Holly Mars, Myers, known as Carlotta the Balloonist, as she began an ascension in 1885. Her husband, Carl, Charles Myers, is on the right. They bought the balloon house, which was built in 1878. They purchased it in 1889. It provided Carl, Mary, and daughter Bessie with spacious living quarters, <clears throat> room for a chemical laboratory, a printing press, carpentry, and machine shops a loft for cutting out and storing balloons, gas generation equipment, shipping rooms, 
and water pumps. And here's a postcard from that time uh, showing the balloon farm in the back and different balloons. I'm not sure if uh, some of those balloons are painted on there, drawn on there, or they actually are ready to take off. But I'd like to read you, see uh, the, the book, it's a children's book down in the right hand corner. Being a, an elementary teacher, I love children's book. And when I found this, um, I just had to buy it. And I'd like to read to you what's written at the end of it. This book is based on stories about the famous Myers family, Professor Carl Myers, who was the inventor and balloon maker. On Balloon Farm in Mohawk Valley, New York, he made balloons for his wife, the fearless and beautiful aeronaut, Carlotta. She was the most expert and popular balloonist in America during the 1880s. Carlotta made more ascensions in hydrogen balloons than any other aeronaut of her life. Her daughter, Bessie, became a balloonist too. She rode a sky cycle invented by her father. Bessie peddled a dirigible inside huge tents and auditoriums ac across the country. Lois Wing Burrell, another interesting scientist. As a graduate student in bacteriology at Cornell, she came up with a cleaning solution to purify milking machines. She married Loomis Burl, whose father had invented the automatic milking machine. They first lived at the Overlook Mansion, which you see there on the right, which was the home of Loomis's parents. They later moved to East Main Street in Little Falls. Educators. And if you notice the top picture on the top right, that's the Utica Female Academy. And it too had an interesting history. The school was opened in 1837 and the building burned in 1865. Around 1871, a new school opened. In 1875, the school was converted to Miss Piat's school. Miss Piat had a well-known reputation for success. She had high standards of achievement. There were no exams or graduations. The school motto was all Khan, which is Dutch for the best as I can be. The expected length of study was two years. The female academy is no more. It were, was replaced in the building below in the 1950s which right now is occupied by the Veterans Outreach Center. More educators. Margaret Tuger. In 1891, at the age of 26, she came to Herkimer to become principal of the Southside School, a school comprised mostly of children from Polish and Italian immigrant families. She loved her church, her country, and her school families. It was evident in the way she ran her school, known for her generosity as well as her school discipline and her parades. She was much loved. She stayed in Herkimer for 38 years. And what is behind her in the old uh, former Tuger School, it is now a senior housing apartment complex and it's on South Main Street in Herkimer. Loretta Douglas. Loretta Douglas is um, shown with the Iliad Municipal Building. This was the site of the Morgan Street School, which became the first Iliad High School. It's, um, the buildings were not the same, but this is the site where the Morgan Street School and the first Iliad High School was. And she was the first principal of the Iliad High School. She expect much from Iliad grads as future leaders. She later taught in Utica, this educator spent 46 years impacting countless lives. Writers. We have Alberta Dickinson. And if you notice the building below, take note of that. That is the Globe building. The Saturday Globe was the first illustrated newspaper in the U.S. and started in 1881. Its size and readership grew at remarkable speed. In its, in its heyday, it had a circulation of 200,000 copies. Circulation declined in the 1920s because of competition 
and the newspaper folded it in 1924. And this is the empty lot underneath the exit ramp on Genesee Street and 5S and Broad Street. Alberta Dickinson, her picture there, she's surrounded by men. In the bigger picture that this was cropped out of, there are more men that surround her. And this was a kind of an example of how she was a single girl among all of these men who worked for the Globe. Alberta started at an early age working in the newspaper business, first in various positions for the Saturday Globe and later writing articles for the Utica Observer Dispatch. She is best remembered for her weekly column, People Worth Knowing. I used People Worth Knowing and Alberta Dickinson as a source for the lady that was on the last slide, Loretta Douglas. And uh, much of my information was provided by Alberta. Marjorie Rawlings, she wrote novels with rural themes and settings. Her best known work, The Yearling, won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1939. It was later made into a movie. The other book that's there, Cross Creek, was also made into a movie. She bought a farm in Van Hornsville right while writing Sojourner. She enjoyed visiting the farm every year up until her death. We saw just a little bit of this farm passing by quickly, but what she left behind is books. Equal justice? Question mark. And I'd like, to, what, we don't have a picture of Martha Bradstreet, but we have here is a ruling by the Honorable Alfred Conklin, who was father of Roscoe Conklin. And it was about litigation that Martha brought to court about land matters. Martha challenged the legal status of married women who were not allowed to own property. At stake was a section of Cosby Manor that she believed was part of her, of her inheritance. She proved herself adapted handling complicated property issues using the courts to validate her claims and newspapers to sway public opinion. Now, but what she was fighting over was land that was part of Cosby Manor. And what she, the section that she talked about was three miles from the river, east as far as Genesee Street, and west as far as Barrick and Lafayette. This was a huge chunk of land. Martha eventually had some favorable rulings, but it, she didn't live long enough to win. Solana Drews suffered years of mental and physical abuse from her husband. She brutally murdered him, involving her children in the heinous act. She was tried and executed on February 28, 1887 in Herkimer. This was the only execution ever to be held here, and Roxolana was the last woman hanged in New York State. Now, why should we put a murderer in this book? To show what times were like and the lack of rights that women had. Roxolana had no place to turn. Her husband was evidently mentally ill. There was no services for him and there was no service for her. Thankfully now uh, we have some things that are in place to help such people as Roxolana and her husband. And I would like to read something that uh, was written by Joyce Murphy in her article that was in Women Belong in History Books about Roxolana. And this is a quote from Governor David B. Hill, who uh, he was the one that had the last say about whether she was going to be hanged or not. And he decided to not commute her. The law of the state made by man is simply in harmony with the law of the Almighty, providing that a commutation would only result in more husband killers. That's an example of what Roxolana faced, where women did not have voices. Organizations that supported women. The top of the list is the YWCA, still in existence today. Since its beginning, the YWCA has driven to create an environment of education and empowerment for women. Through the years, programs have focused on job training, social opportunities, 
physical well-being, and more recently on social justice and crisis intervention. And uh, the buildings that are mentioned here, 16 Hopper Street used to be an apartment building and a boarding house for 10 women that operated through the YWCA. And in 1916, a building at 1000 Cornelia Street was purchased. 2017, the organization expanded to 7 Rutger Park, whose picture is in the lower right-hand corner there. Harriet Aykroyd was a businesswoman. She worked in the Utica Fire Insurance for 45 years. She was involved in the community and served as president and director of the YWCA. She was also part of Zanta, president of Zanta, trustee for the New Century Club, director of the Central School of Nursing and head of part of the Oneida County Red Cross that trained and placed gray ladies at Rhodes General Hospital for wounded soldiers during World War II. New Century Club is no longer in existence, but it was an important part of uh, communication in the early part of, of, the 19th, of the 20th century. This building still stands, and that's a recent picture, and it, the building is being renovated. This club was begun in order to meet the needs of Utica women who are eager for social, a social center where members could share their interests, knowledge, and talents with other members. The club offered cultural, educational, and vocational services to its members and the community. And we have Ida Jane Butcher, who was very active in this club. And one of something that she wrote, she helped write, the outline history of Utica and vicinity that she wrote in 1900 was a source that I used in looking for information to present here. Mary Brewerton Hedges had a variety of life experiences. As a botanist, she discovered new plant species. She was also a teacher and newspaper editor. She conducted lectures at New Century Club on art, literature, and science. Okay, now we're getting more into equal rights and women's suffrage. And I wanted to talk about the woman on the left there, Paulina Wright Davis. Paulina, along with her husband, Francis Wright, organized an anti-slavery convention in Utica in 1835. A riotous mob attacked their house. After her husband's death in 1845, she relocated and remarried, becoming a leader in the National Women's Suffrage Association. The UNA, a magazine publication founded by Paulina W. Davis in 1853, was widely recognized as the first periodical of the women's rights movement. To her right is Mechanics Hall, and I have pictures of the duo, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who were powerhouses in the women's movement. And Mechanics Hall was built in 1837 and was the scene of political rallies and conventions. In 1861, Susan B. Anthony and 25 other abolitionists were not per permitted to speak in Mechanics Hall in Utica. Her scheduled talk, No Compromise with Slavery, was canceled by the Common Council because of fear that such a gathering may cause a riot. Now, here we go. That was 1861. Here we go, five years later. And this is what Anthony tells the crowd. There is nothing in the current constitution that prevents women from voting or being elected, delegates to the convention. Not too many years ago, a mob in Utica's common council stopped me from speaking in this very building. Now people are in sympathy with our cause and are willing to listen to what I have to say. Here's Mechanics Hall today. The building still stands. Ariskany and Hotel Streets. It's not in the greatest shape, but it, it's still there and it, it is, has so much history. If Walls could talk, this building would have a lot to say. Women's suffrage in Utica. 
I thought I would present a song while I showed these pictures and talked about a timeline. In 1894, Susan B. Anthony spoke at Utica Opera House, sponsored by the New Century Club. In 1899, the Utica Political Equality Club was formed. In 1912, New York State Women's Suffrage Convention was held in Utica at Genesee Hall. 1913 and 1914 were suffrage parades. There's a picture of one there. These took place on Genesee Street. 1915, Lucy Carlisle Watson carried the suffrage liberty torch through Utica. 1915 also, women's right to vote was defeated by popular vote in New York State. 1917, William Jennings Bryant and Carrie Chapman Catt addressed a crowd at Avon Theater. 1917, women's right to vote was approved by New York State voters. 1919, first convention of the New York State League of Women Voters took place at the Utica Hotel. 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution gave women the right to vote nationwide. leaders in the women's suffrage in Oneida County and Herkimer County. Lucy Carlisle Watson was a prominent local leader of women's suffrage. She served as president of the Utica Political Equality Club from 1900 to 1915. She organized two women's rights marches along Genesee Street. <clears throat> Zeta Zoller, oh, up, back to Lucy. Um, I, there's a picture of her house that was located along Genesee Street. Her house is no longer there. What replaced it is in between Bank, which you see there at 270 Genesee Street. Zeta Zoller, I have her with the Herkimer County Humane Society, that she was instrumental in starting that. And that was Herkimer County's first humane society, which was started in 1913. Zeta's picture, and the same exact picture, is hanging in that building. She headed the local League of Women Voters. She chaired Little Falls Suffrage Party, was a DRA regent, and was a member of the Red Cross Ladies Canteen Service Committee. Caring for the SEC. Grace Norris, who is by the uh, depot in South Columbia. And these, one of these buildings still stands in that area. She received her MD degree in 1904. She became, began her career by opening an office in Columbia Center. She later practiced medicine in New York City and Utica. In 1919, the people of Oneida County elected her cor coroner making her the first woman in the U.S. to ever hold this position. Libby Kowalski was known for her caring attention she brought to the sick. She is in front of St. Isa Ho Hospital, which saw her visit there many times and tend to the patients emotionally and gave them and was able to talk to them which a lot of times the loneliness is hard for patients to handle. The Libby Kowalski wing of Citroen Home was dedicated in her memory and her years of service to the community. Supporting national pride, Katie Jones. I have her in front of the Alien Methodist Church on the corner of 2nd and West Street. And she was an organist there and that was her church. She also was a national leader. She was president of the Women's Relief Corps, an organization whose goal was to relieve the suffering of disabled veterans of the Civil War, as well as their survivors, and to promote patronism. patriotism. It kind of shows you something about her personality and drive because she was able to persuade all of the schools all over the US to 
have flags hung in every school. And this was something because at the time there was hard feelings. Um, it was after the Civil War and there was some resentment to the flag. But she was able to charm her way and to get people to do this. Catherine Buckley, when her husband died unexpectedly, Catherine was left alone to raise two small children. She was deputy Oneida County clerk and part of her job was to run the naturalization office where she actively helped many immigrants become citizens. In her spare time, she was very active in numerous organizations, including the Catholic Women's Club. I have her in front of the Oneida County office bill, uh, office there, because this is where people obtained and were sworn in as citizens. And Herkimer County Homes State Historic Site and Delight Ransom Keller, a remarkable woman. In 1898, she was instrumental along with her charter of chapter of the DAR and the Herkimer and Oneida Historical Societies in erecting a monument at the grave of General Herkimer, which is on the top right picture there. She originated the idea of making the 40 mile route that General Herkimer and the Tryon County Militia marched from General's home the Aristide Battlefield, which was dedicated in 1912. One of the plaques is there. In 1914, she also secured an appropriation for the, from the state for the purchase and preservation of the General Nicholas Herkimer home, which is shown there. Philanthropists. Rosamond Childs, and I have her with the present day location of the Community Foundation of Herkimer and Oneida Counties, which has its goal, commitment of money and resources from generations to provide for the lives of future generations. Rosamond Childs was one of the first directors serving from 1954 until 1968 her generosity created its first fund of $6,000. After her death, she contributed a whopping $5.6 million to the fund. Down below Rosman is Corinne and Douglas Robinson Jr. And we, I talked about Corinne before. Corinne is seated, is, oh, hang on, is seated right here. This is Corinne, this is her hug, husband. Douglas Robinson Jr. They gave money for building the Jordanville Library in honor of his parents. And here's his mother, Fanny, and his father, Douglas. And the next slide shows the library being dedicated by Corinne's brother, who at the time was president of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt in the audience at the time was a future president, Franklin, who attended this dedication. And this occurred on August 26, 1908. Mrs. Helen Roosevelt Robinson was present 50 year, at the 50 year anniversary of the library in 1958. Okay, I talked about the Proctor ladies, here they are with their husbands. Both sisters and husbands collectively gifted the land for the Utica Public Library. They made land donations to the Utica Park System, Thomas Proctor Park, Frederick Proctor Park, Watson Williams Park, Watson Williams Park, Grace Church and Ladies Chapel and the Parish House. And the last slide about the ladies is this one here. And I want to show that bottom picture is of Mariah Par Proctor leaving um, the monument there at Bag Square. And she had um, taken it upon herself to um, take down Bag's Hotel 
during the depression and she didn't have any use, didn't have any heavy machinery brought in. She had laborers do it so that they could get money for jobs as well as use the materials for fuel, for cooking and heating in their homes. She gave money to the banks of Utica so they would not go bankrupt during the depression. On the top, I wanted to read, this is on that building at the very top and it says, Utica, an honorable and patriotic city from the earliest of days, let us keep up high standards. Okay. And the eagle is the eagle that she dedicated to her husband overlooking the parks. Now, Jane's goal was to present these ladies so they would not be forgotten. And in the books that were created, there is space for people to write about noteworthy people in their lives. And when I do this talk, I stress that it's important to write down before people are forgotten and times are forgotten. And all this information about loved ones, to take the time to write it down. My last slide, I'm um, again showing the, the pass that we took for our bus tours. And uh, there's a whole section of Oneida and Herkimer County that we have not explored. And we're looking to do more bus tours in the future to present more ladies in the spots where they created history. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to extend my thanks one more time to Jane, who changed my life and um, just keeps, uh, keeps going, keeps uh, giving back to the community in the form of revealing history. Thank you for listening, and I thank Rebecca too for asking me to do this. Okay, and I am at an end here.